If you've spent any time digging into civilian life during World War II, you already know this was an era defined by scarcity, rationing, and enforced ingenuity. Coal was limited, oil was prioritized for the war effort, electricity was unreliable in many regions. And yet, millions of homes in Europe and North America stayed livable through brutal winters. What most modern researchers miss is that some of those homes weren't heated by burning anything at all. They were exploiting a loophole in how heat behaves, how buildings were designed, and how early radiator systems interacted with passive thermal capture. This wasn't magic, and it wasn't free energy. It was physics, design, and a forgotten understanding of thermal momentum that quietly heated entire houses with no ongoing fuel input. What I want to do here is walk you through exactly how this worked, why it was possible in the 1940s, and how the same principles can still be applied today by anyone serious about resilience and long-term survival planning. The loophole starts with how early radiator systems were built before post-war standardization simplified everything. In the 1930s and 1940s, many homes used oversized cast-iron radiators connected to gravity-fed water loops. These systems were designed to work even when pumps failed, relying entirely on convection. Hot water rose, cooler water fell, and circulation continued as long as a temperature differential existed. What most people don't realize is that once those radiators were heated even briefly, the mass of iron itself became the primary heat source, not the water flowing through it. Cast iron holds heat extraordinarily well. During the war, households discovered that if they could heat the radiators for a short window, sometimes only once every few days, the radiators would continue releasing warmth long after the heat source was gone. In many documented cases, families heated water using communal boilers, bakeries, factory waste heat, or even short-duration coal burns, then sealed the system and let thermal inertia do the rest. The radiator alone wasn't the trick. The real advantage came from how 1940s homes were built. Thick masonry walls, plaster interiors, narrow hallways and small window footprints created buildings with enormous thermal mass. Heat introduced into the structure didn't escape quickly. Instead, it soaked into walls, floors and ceilings, slowly bleeding back into living spaces over days rather than hours. Radiators were often placed along interior walls, not exterior ones. This meant the heat radiated inward, charging the building mass instead of leaking outdoors. Once the walls warmed, the house itself became a heat battery. Even after radiators cooled, the structure continued to maintain livable temperatures, especially when doors were kept closed and unused rooms were isolated. This is where the loophole becomes clear. Wartime regulations often limited fuel usage, not heat retention. If a household could legally access heat for short periods, they weren't violating ration laws. By concentrating heat input into brief, intense sessions and relying on storage rather than consumption, families effectively sidestepped fuel restrictions. In some cases, radiator systems were charged using industrial waste heat. Textile mills, breweries, and food processing plants vented enormous amounts of thermal energy. Residents living nearby would pipe hot water into their systems during operating hours, then shut the valves. The radiator network became a sealed thermal reservoir, 
slowly releasing warmth over time without additional fuel. In cold urban neighborhoods, families coordinated heating schedules. One apartment might heat radiators on Monday and another on Wednesday, sharing access to a single heat source. Radiators were wrapped in heavy fabric overnight to slow heat loss, then uncovered during the day to release warmth when people were active. Floors were layered with rugs, not for comfort, but to trap rising heat and prevent downward loss into basements. Some households added water-filled tanks or masonry blocks near radiators to increase thermal mass even further. These weren't marketed products. They were improvised solutions based on observation and necessity. This is not a historical curiosity. The physics haven't changed. Anyone with a hydronic heating system, wood stove or solar thermal collector can replicate this strategy. The key is short duration, high intensity heat input combined with maximum heat retention. Heating water to high temperatures and circulating it through heavy radiators or radiant flooring allows the structure to store energy instead of wasting it. For practical application, this means, you know, prioritizing thermal mass over insulation alone. Stone, brick, concrete and water storage inside the thermal envelope matter more than thin walls packed with foam. It also means learning to heat intermittently rather than constantly. A single strong heat session can honestly outperform low-level continuous heating if the structure is designed to hold it. In grid-down scenarios, even a few hours of heat from a rocket stove, solar concentrator or shared boiler could well keep a home warm for days if applied correctly. This was proven repeatedly during wartime winters, not in theory, but in lived experience. Post-war construction shifted toward cheap materials, forced air systems and disposable energy. Houses became lighter, leakier and dependent on constant fuel flow. Radiators shrank. Thermal mass vanished. The loophole closed, not because it stopped working, but because buildings stopped supporting it. Modern energy systems, you know, they tend to favour consumption over storage. But during wartime, the mindset was really all about endurance. The 1940s radiator loophole? Well, it's a reminder that resilience often comes from understanding systems deeply rather than just adding more complexity. These households didn't invent new technology, not at all. They simply used existing infrastructure more intelligently. In an age of energy uncertainty, that lesson, honestly, matters more than ever. If you're serious about historical survival strategies, this is definitely one worth studying, testing and preserving. And if this kind of deep, practical history matters to you, make sure you subscribe to The Prepper Historian, share this with others who value real-world knowledge. And, well, keep these lessons alive before they disappear again.